Okay, so last week was pretty hype. But that's last week. It's in the past. This week, we're turning things up a notch as we springboard off the back of the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai and into the sprawling and powerful arcs covered today. Something I hope will be apparent in this particular video is the slow progression Toriyama takes in not only creating and expanding his world, but also the rogues gallery of villains that populate this increasingly wondrous and dangerous landscape too. In this installment of my Dragon Ball review, I'm taking a look at a particularly notorious group responsible for horrors even those having only seen Dragon Ball Z might remember. I am of course talking about Son Goku's first clash with the infamous Red Ribbon Army. This is gonna be a big one guys, so let's not delay. I'm Toy Not Mark and this is my review of Akira Toriyama's underrated and undefeated Dragon Ball. My biggest nitpick concerning the modern Dragon Ball Super anime, for those of you that haven't seen that review series I made over a year ago, has to be its sudden and abrupt cold openings to new arcs. When the Battle of Gods arc ends, it ends, and then a completely new story disconnected from the prior material would begin anew, and the same is true for Universe 6 and Goku Black and so forth. And all of these feel like self-contained stories, not necessarily connected in any meaningful way narratively to the prior. This doesn't bother everyone, but to me, it misses a mark the original Dragon Ball and Z would always hit. For instance, off the back of the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai that I covered last week, there's some nice light-hearted humor with Goku pretty much eating all the prize money's worth of food, courtesy of Roshi himself, but what I like most about this scene was its immediate redirection of her attention towards a new goal. A goal that will inform the direction for the next arc, the retrieval of Grandpa Gohan's four-star Dragon Ball. The Red Ribbon Army Saga. As has been the case since the beginning of this story thus far, moving forward there will continue to be a pervasive and strong comedic energy throughout the upcoming material. However, what I want to draw your attention to before we get into the story proper is as it progresses, I'd like for you guys to pay attention to the slowly escalating sense of drama and stakes. I ask this not because there will necessarily be noticeable stakes in this video, I mean there very well might be, lord knows I'm not going to spoil you, but this escalation in mood, stakes and drama will undoubtedly manifest in some impressive and game-changing changing ways later. And so, as we race forward into this brave new world in search of Goku's four-star Dragon Ball, I think you should keep in mind where we started in the last video and appreciate the growth as it becomes more and more distinct, slowly becoming the story we're familiar with in Z. So, Goku slung across the sky when he's suddenly shot down by a missile launcher. I repeat, Goku and Kidoon are both blown out of the sky by a missile launcher. Everyone, this is the first contact Goku makes with the antagonists of this arc. Through one Colonel Silver, he has unknowingly and single-handedly created an enemy that will become more powerful than he or anyone else in this world could possibly imagine. In this story, Goku challenges the most powerful evil organization in the world, the Red Ribbon Army. Also in search of the Dragon Balls. Speaking to the driving forces of this narrative, something I thought was great was how Goku's friendship with Bulma was the reason he's able to hone in on these Dragon Balls much faster and more effectively than the Red Ribbon Army can. Organically, it creates the necessary tension to bring them into contact and without words communicates why they are in conflict. It's a wonderful mechanism in this regard that's quite believable. Muscle Tower while this Red Ribbon Army arc is the longest of any we've covered thus far, dealing with three commanding officers increasing in importance as we go through the three acts of this story, in this opening act we're kicking things off with General White and his fortress shrouded in treacherous icy tundra. This is a terrific example again of Akira Toriyama's desire to create an interesting but easy to understand place to take full advantage of his audience's anticipation and his ability to draw well in 3D space. If his audience can understand the space in a three-dimensional sense, then he can do much more with the action. When I first read through this years ago, something I didn't fully appreciate was how nice it was that we got some time to spend with Goku one-on-one -on -one as a character, alone. I was honestly pretty surprised it took so long for something like this to happen. Oh, and 
by the way. This opening arc, which effectively acts as an empowerment to the audience and Goku as they cut through the Red Ribbon Army like butter, watching as he obliterates his way through General White's defenses floor after floor is again very fun, but this section is also reinforcing Goku's character as someone that will want to do the right thing for those that did right by him, protecting the defenseless village against the Red Ribbon Army, who are looking to get the Dragon Ball in the area and radar into their possession. In other words, Goku's protecting those that need his protection, hearkening back to the last arc's philosophy and and I loved it. Furthermore, the framing of these encounters is sort of gamified or fun for lack of a better term. The goal is to get to the top of the tower, reprimand General White, and save the town's mayor from capture, with every floor introducing more and more intense conflicts, going from grunts on the ground floor to the conflict with Full Metal Jacket on the third, the first robotic foe Goku has faced in the series. Definitely a trend of things to come. This fight against Full Metal Jacket is actually sort of suspenseful, mostly because it provides a strong contrast with the initial floors and confrontations between Goku and the earlier portion of the Red Ribbon Army, with Colonel Silver not putting up much of a fight at all. With this fight totally taking Goku and his new extensive powers totally by surprise, as the mechanical monstrosity relentlessly pushes Goku more than any fight he's encountered since Roshi. The fourth floor fight against Sergeant Major Purple, the ninja, is very comedy focused. The purple fight consists of, at first, a game of hide and seek, with Goku foiling his concealment strategies at every conceivable turn in increasingly ridiculous fashion. Overall, compared to the prior bout, this encounter acts as another opportunity for Goku to flex how much more powerful he is than a cocky opponent. It's tonally completely different to the Full Metal Jacket fight, leaning perhaps more than any other fight into the more comedic gag format. And I say that while also being fully aware that earlier, Goku sent a humanoid gangster rabbit to the moon on an extendable pole. As soon as Android 8 shows his face, he immediately contrasted himself with Full Metal Jacket, and I fell in love with his character for that. He's so ominous and domineering physically, but totally harmless personally, which is, in and of itself, another nice contrast to oppose Goku's small but impossibly strong persona. Only on this second read-through am I noticing all of these contrasts Toriyama has implemented here. I also love the role that Android 8 plays in helping Goku overcome this ninja man in addition to helping Goku navigate the mazes that comprise the upper levels of Muscle Tower. I like it because it ultimately means that Goku manages to escape this tower and reach where he wants to go because of him being a decent person deep down and for no other reason really. And despite the situation with General White coming to a close in relatively quick fashion, Goku employs some terrific and clever strategy against the General's jiggly contingency plan, utilizing information he gleaned from a young girl earlier towards the beginning of the arc, demonstrating applied knowledge. Way to go, Goku! But again, because this is a very long arc sprawling across 41 chapters, Akira Toriyama decided to break it up into three easily identifiable portions, but linked them wonderfully. And so, with the Muscle Tower portion now after coming to a close, we get our next goal almost immediately off the back of the last segment. You see, during the assault on the tower, Goku broke the Dragon Radar, an understandable and believable consequence that will drag him back into contact with the weird and wonderful girl who started this series with him, Bulma. I'll only touch on this briefly, <laughs> because it's only a minor part of the story, but Goku arriving in West City in search of Bulma is handled to absolute perfection. Knowing Goku's origin and seeing where he is now in a bustling metropolis, it stands to reason that the very first time he enters a big city like this, it'd be a fish out of water type scenario. And for some reason, on my first read through, I never anticipated this. Running around to random people asking them where Bulma is was a subtle but brilliant insight into what Goku's expectations and experiences up until now have been, with him going as far as to remark, Huh, you live in the same town, but you don't know who she is? I love dialogue like that. It really gives us great insight into the character's sensibilities and expectations. His search for Bulma is probably the funniest and most endearing chapter in the story that I've read thus far. It's full of innocent hijinks with Goku taking center stage, trying his best to understand the social customs of the area, going as far as winning money in street fights because he was led to believe money equals someone telling him where Bulma is. And when he learns that cops can help him, the person he asks to to find a cop gets all that money that he won. It's brilliant, it's light, it's over. Next, General Blue Saga. I swear to God, 
Blue. During the pursuit of the next Dragon Ball, I loved Bulma's inclusion and I thought it was top notch. On top of her being, in essence, a terrific plot device that can provide Goku with any help he might need, she's also a great character full of personality. This Okay, might seem like a random side note, but one aspect of GT that I didn't like much was how they used, or should I say, didn't use the character of Pan. Introduced in the opening episode with a lot of promise, I quickly found myself invested in her budding story and gravitated towards the character, but it never amounted to anything. She'd always get in the way, needed saving, and contributed little, if anything, other than complaining or motivating Goku through capture. And while Bulma still needs help from Goku, Goku wouldn't have ever found his way to this Dragon Ball beneath the ocean alone, and that's ignoring the dragon radar she gave him in the first place. Goku would quite literally be lost without her in this instance. She more than pulls her weight in the greater story, or at least she would if she didn't accidentally take her dad's capsules instead. And so they reach out to borrow Roshi's submarine thing. And it's here I notice the degree to just how empowering this arc is. During this material, Goku is very seldom, if ever, on the back foot, dominating every encounter with the Red Ribbon Army's increasingly competent officials that each, without fail, commit the cardinal sin of underestimating our little hero. One scene in particular that stands out to me as specifically cathartic in this regard is the confrontation Roshi and Launch experience on the island with the Red Ribbon Army themselves. The fashion with which Launch and specifically Roshi disarmed the situation and clobber every single soldier was amazing to read through. Further, adding value to my Dragon Ball experience. I mean, if you're from an English-speaking country, odds are your first introduction to the series was through Dragon Ball Z. And in that story, Roshi plays such a minuscule role, you'd be forgiven for thinking he wasn't anything special at any point in time. But through these early arcs, revisiting them helps to reinforce the type of powerful and competent character he actually is. What makes this middle portion of the story so fun, at least for me, is how bamboozled and perplexed the Red Ribbon Army under General Blue and Red are. They are constantly blown away by Goku's speed, moving from one location to another, his ability to locate Dragon Balls immediately, which they lack the tech to do, and of course, his otherworldly strength and fighting prowess. And at the moment, General Blue and his forces are in pursuit of Goku, Bulma, and Krillin as they venture down using Roshi's sub in an underwater cave in search of the four-star ball. Now cards on the table here. I think of the three sections I'll be discussing of the Red Ribbon Army arc, this General Blue saga is perhaps the least interesting. I think in large part because the second act is in large part difficult to make as interesting in a story. Any story. With it primarily serving the purpose of building up to the events I am super excited to discuss later on concerning the third act. With that said however, there are still a lot of aspects to this act, particularly from a humor perspective, that I really appreciated. General Blue is easily the highlight in terms of characters presented from the the Red Ribbon Army side of things, perhaps throughout the entire arc itself. His ruthless pursuit of her heroes, his merciless and scary disregard for human life, contrasting beautifully with his otherwise clean-cut persona, carrying with it a sprinkle of camp humor. He's a bizarre and capable leader and fighter that places our heroes in trouble on more than one occasion. Speaking of which... Earlier I mentioned that virtually every advancement the Red Ribbon Army made on our heroes resulted in their ultimate downfall, thus empowering our heroes beyond what they already were in our minds as readers or viewers. Well, that was until General Blue finally started to roll up his sleeves, or take off his shirt, whatever you choose. And what I enjoyed about his clash with Krillin wasn't what I saw, but instead, what I didn't see. Our last checking in with Krillin was during the semi-finals of the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai wherein he demonstrated his martial arts ability against the eventual winner of the tournament in Jackie Chun. Having narrowly lost that bout against the eventual winner, Krillin was seen, at least to me, as close to Goku's level of strength and thus this was still his standing alongside the current cast going into the confrontation with General Blue. So, keeping in mind that the Red Ribbon Army had effectively been the punching bag of the heroes up until now and that Krillin is seen as a powerful fighter akin to Goku, you'll maybe get a taste of what sort of shock a reader would have had in Japan during the time that they turned the page to see this. We don't see this fight. It simply cuts from before the fight to after it, creating a great contrast visually, but as I drew attention to earlier, contrasted powerfully with how we thought things would go too. Boastful, prideful, flamboyant, and downright ruthless, General Blue comes out of this encounter virtually unscathed. And with him mere seconds away from crushing a paralyzed Krillin's skull with a boulder, the consequences of this meeting really start to set in. And I love it when Toriyama leverages that aspect of comedy or the gag comic format to create sudden and abrupt moments of desperation for his readers. And I do so because when a character is moments from a gruesome death, it creates the perfect opportunity for a moment 
like this. This is the first really dramatic save Goku has made that I've recognized. Before this in the first arc, any save he would otherwise make would be accompanied with significant comedic references, visuals, or some combination of the two. However, this save is framed as being entirely dramatic. It's subtle, but the development of that more serious tone ever present in Z is slowly seeping through the pages, gradually, even as early as here. The fight itself is perfectly fine, but nothing particularly interesting outside of that specific tonal shift I mentioned. Effectively, the fight continues as many Dragon Ball fights do in the early chapters with some nice paneling and gag humor to undercut the entire affair. Goku overcomes Blue, he puts a rat in his mouth and they yeet themselves back to the surface. Some more hijinks takes place with Launch and General Blue on Roshi's Island that is way more funny than it has any right to be and then Goku starts making his way to a familiar setting for some. <laughs> Jokes aside, everyone, G Fuel has been the best sponsor I've worked with in my career, in all honesty. The people are amazing, and there's virtually no filter or script for me to read off of, as made evident by this commercial they allowed me to make. I've tried the product, and I sincerely think it's delicious. So if you'd like to try it for yourself or want to help out the channel, click the link in the description below. Thank you, everyone. As will become something of a tradition with Toriyama's work, he likes to cameo old characters and not from the same property, but from entirely different series. Now, I realize I'm speaking to a minority when I say this, but similar to Jacko the Galactic Patrolman, a manga written after Dragon Ball ended by Akira Toriyama himself, he decided to make it known that the story shares the same world as Dragon Ball did. And similarly to that, the final chapters of the General Blue arc, Goku and the titular General, sort of stumble into the peculiar Penguin Village. Fans of his previous Dr. Slump material will love this segment of the story as it goes out of its way to bring the energy of the property to the forefront. Perhaps, however, at the expense of the newly established Dragon Ball tone, though. It's a nice callback section with its own independent high points, but I'd be lying if I thought it wouldn't have been served better by sticking to its own property. Where Jocko's manga benefited, I thought, from linking itself to the greater Toriverse, I don't think this arc got any more from this particular interaction in Penguin Village. With that said, while it was overly lighthearted, those of you that keep tabs on story tone might anticipate a tonal shift soon. For when something good happens in a story, normally, around the next corner is something likely not too friendly. Commander Red Saga. This is the final act of the Red Ribbon Army arc, and while I did enjoy the prior portions, this upcoming final part is my absolute favorite and the section I've been itching to talk about all video long. I love the setting, I love the expanded lore it offers, and above all else, I love it for one reason specifically. Now, moving at speed towards another group of Red Ribbon Army soldiers led by Colonel Yellow, we pick up with Upa and his father. These character designs clearly take inspiration from Native Americans in North America, and they are pretty cool. Particularly the father character. He's not overly complicated, but he's courageous, righteous, and noble. And he's guarding an area called the Corin Sanctuary from the incoming Red Ribbon Army, when suddenly... 
Having just saved this young boy, Goku finally is reunited with his grandpa's four-star Dragon Ball. It's a great moment to finally see this young man reunited with his prized possession and all by coming to the rescue of this group. It's a really nice virtuous moment that yields what he's been searching for all of this time. But just as they're celebrating, a certain assassin is hired by the Red Ribbon Army to help recover what they've lost. Tao Pai Pai, touted as the greatest assassin for hire in the world, is, in addition to the impressive in-universe accolade, one of the most underrated villains in the entire Dragon Ball universe. There are a ton of genuinely impressive villains later that take the spotlight in the global zeitgeist, but unlike many of them, this man genuinely would have scared me as a child. In a story with such a large focus on joy, adventure, and comedy, for this no-nonsense, cold-blooded killer to now act as the main antagonist for this section was a shock to my system. You feel the tone shift violently as soon as he takes control of the narrative, introduced to us primarily through his first task of killing General Blue for his past failures. Keep also in mind the fact that Blue has been perhaps the single best challenge to Goku behind Roshi, and the fashion with which Tao disposes of Blue is as unorthodox as it is chilling. <clears throat> yeah. This is someone that wastes no time in killing his opponent, and to add to his intimidation factor, he performs physical feats never before seen in the series. Like, for example, he's informed that a jet is prepared to transport him to Korin Sanctuary so that he can deal with Goku right there and then. However, he declines, rips a pillar from the wall, throws it into the air, and rides it over the horizon, citing that he'll be back shortly with everything they requested in tow. I'd argue that this scene, while silly, ought to be, I think, as iconic as Frieza's floating chair thing. What a visual and what a guy. Goku vs Tao Pai Pai Every single molecule of this fight drives home one specific message. Tao is impossibly powerful, fast, and deadly. Landing thunderously before Goku and his friends, the pillar crashes to the ground and in mere moments Upa's father is mercilessly killed. There's no time to even catch our breath or register the emotions necessary to understand the horror and tragedy for Upa because Tao, like a monster turning his attention to Goku, unleashes a massive strike toward him. This is the first high drama encounter and fight that there's been in the series. There are no jokes here, there's no levity, and there's no ostentatious flaunting of techniques or poses. This is business, and in a few strikes, while easily absorbing Goku's absolute best, fires the kill shot towards Goku. This fight felt like a runaway train that out of nowhere ended in an instant. And I mean that in the best possible way. And as Goku lies there motionless, I couldn't help but think about how this moment might feel in retrospect. One particular element of Dragon Ball that I absolutely adored was how routinely our main character, Goku, would ultimately be defeated in combat. Particularly during the early material, it made for much more interesting fights, bolstered also by the scope of the main cast. Dragon Balls are still very much a struggle to acquire without the aid of Goku, and at this point, he's been defeated both by Roshi acting as Jackie Chun, and now Mercenary Tao. This is a character that, while powerful, gifted, and with his intentions honest, still comes up against mountains he has to humble himself before. And it's in the face of these encounters we see what Goku is truly made of. Speaking from experience, I think one stands to learn a lot about someone, or in this case, a character, when they face devastating defeat. Winning does offer plenty of opportunity for personality identifiers, but few instances in our lives, I think, highlight what we're made of better than a loss. And the more devastating, the better. Goku very nearly died in horrific death by the lightning fast hands of this psychopath. And how did he survive? Dragon Ball! Rooting around for the reason behind his survival, he finds that the four-star ball blocked the final shot from Tao, citing that his grandpa saved him. It's a touching and beautiful sentiment, particularly when you consider that Goku was given that Dragon Ball in the first place for being a good person. But the means with which he survived, while thematically and symbolically gorgeous, at the end of the day only further served to highlight just how impossibly lucky Goku was in this exchange. For many, this would be enough to push one into reconsidering their life's direction. Action. Surrounded by a terrified child and the corpse of his father, Goku is faced with this scary close call while holding what he came on this dangerous adventure for, the Four Star Ball. He secured his goal and could very easily call it a day here. But to Goku, none of this matters. In fact, I wouldn't even be surprised if none of this even crossed his mind as a possibility. For the moment he assessed the situation, Goku realizes that there's only one thing he can do, and he jumps to it.
For those of you that don't know, this is significant because, as legend has it, in this chapter, if one can climb this tower, they will be trained by a master capable of vastly improving their ability and strength. And according to those Goku spoke to, no one in recent memory has climbed it. Scary for any sane human being, sure, but Goku continues to climb fearlessly. And as Goku begins scaling this ridiculous structure, we're greeted by some more gorgeous Toriyama paneling, showing our hero tirelessly scaled this thought to be near impossible structure to climb, forcing us as readers to notice that not only is Goku doing this because he wants to resurrect Upa's father, but he's also doing this in the way that he's supposed to, without the help of Kinto. Going as far as to sleep on the side of the tower, waking up with little strength left as the sun rises. About to reach his limit, he sees something. One aspect of this reread through the series that I've noticed has been all of the elements to Dragon Ball Z that I liked being present and clearly inspired from choices made during this material to some extent. Jackie Chan versus Goku's beam struggle is clearly a trope that will be used for years to come. I've mentioned numerous narrative trends with Goku and his allies that will become more consistent as time moves forward, and I'm now noticing it more consistently with Karin's Sanctuary. It's very clearly operating under the same narrative principle that Snake Way and King Kai enjoyed. Think about it, a hermit martial arts master living at the end of a perilous journey our hero must brave in order to achieve the strength possible to defeat evil and protect others. The description works perfectly for both King Kai and Korin. So when you look at this, thinking about Korin as a prototype King Kai character, what was Goku's experience like with him on the tower? Well, it actually is a little less straightforward than King Kai's. Unlike him, Korin's teachings are a little more sneaky, a misdirect if you will, tasking Goku immediately with drinking some special water atop a pedestal. It very much becomes a high stakes game of keep away as Goku for three days chases the little cat man all over the tower in an effort to get his hands on this special water. And while this encounter was brief, it illuminated for me something wonderful about Goku's character yet again. Apart from the physical space being kept between Goku and Korin himself, he additionally puts Goku to the test in other ways. The first is a bit more direct than the others, however. He throws the Dragon Ball off the edge, forcing Goku to have to run down and back up. But what really impressed me the most about Goku in this scene was his mental honor and strength strength. Most obviously, there's a small interaction during one of the nights where Goku contemplates and puts himself into the position to take the water while Korin sleeps. However, despite this opportunity that's presenting itself, just like his refusal to use Kintawun, he decides to not take that chance. But what Goku didn't know was that Korin was conscious the entire time and acknowledges in his mind his honor being greater than that of his master Roshi, who also was there, opting to achieve the victory here the right way. And this moment is made all the more significant as twice before it, Goku is made aware of just how daunting this task is. He's told first at the ground that he's unlikely to reach the top, and once he's there, he's told that Roshi took three years to achieve the same feat. The honesty and confidence one must have in their own ability to choose not to take the easy option by stealing it while he sleeps says so much more about the character than any punch, kick, or beam ever could. This is why Goku is where he is today. <laughs> What gives this particular training its own flavor, I think, is its dedication to the mysterious master type format. Unlike King Kai, who was very direct in his approach, the water that Korin was protecting actually has no magical properties. In fact, outside of the one sensu bean Korin gave Goku, the only reason Goku managed to get stronger in any way was due to the extensive chase he gave to Korin and his rescaling of the tower. It's very Karate Kid with Korin being Mr. Miyagi. Through this, Goku manages to multiply his power according to Korin, and so, now it's time to test what the this new power looks like in combat, and arriving in appropriately dramatic fashion to make the save on Upa, Goku touches down on the battlefield. And if you thought the first match with Tao was dominant, this one is 10 times worse. Tao barely lands a single attack on Goku, and when he does, for the most part, it's only because Goku allows him to. What I like about this fight also is the means with which Tao secures his demise. Having spent the last while being faced with the sort of honorable character Goku is when faced with tremendous pressure, Tao is exposed as the slimy, cowardly cheat he is once he starts to feel any level of pressure. Breaking out extra weapons to even the odds for him, ending with him throwing a grenade at Goku, which he easily kicks back into his face. For me, the Korin Tower and Tao Pai Pai stuff was by far the most interesting and entertaining in this arc. What remains in it, however, is effectively a few chapters of Goku feeling like a god as he blasts, punches, and kicks his way through the remaining forces of the most evil organization on Earth. The most interesting aspect of these final moments in the Red Ribbon Army HQ comes by way of Commander Red's mutiny at the hands of his number two. Funnily enough, this whole betrayal comes about because that Red character didn't want to use the balls for world domination, but instead to increase 
increase his height, which, funnily enough, helped me notice yet another parallel, perhaps, between this and modern Dragon Ball, in that being effectively the same sort of wish Frieza wanted to make in the Broly film. But, at the end of the day, when offered a partnership by that new head of the Red Ribbon Army, Goku, without hesitation, said no. After all he's been through this massive arc, he's still the same innocent and honest boy that lived in that small hut in the forests of Mount Paozu. Unfortunately, however, that brings us up to the end of this video. I love the Tao Pai Pai stuff, and I very much enjoyed the slow shift to more serious character writing towards the end of the story. And while I've loved the journey up until this point, from now on, we're moving on to some of the most serious and best written material in the manga. Next time, we're jumping back in with Fortune Teller Baba and another world tournament. I hope you all enjoyed it. Consider subscribing if you don't want to miss the next installment and I'll see you all next time. Hey, hey,